there is the issue of digital security. And what I would suggest here is that this is a fairly fundamental skill that we ought to have to underpin many of our other interactions with IT information technology. So it's fair to say that technology brings us numerous benefits. It's very transformational in many scenarios. But that isn't to say that it's not without some sort of risk to us as users and as organizations that end up using technology if we're not aware of how to use it safely and securely. Now, over the years, as the technology has evolved, as online services have appeared, there's numerous additional threats that have come along to accompany the technology that we rely on. And it's unfortunate to say that many users still lack some of the basic skills and basic awareness to protect them against some of the very early threats. And so as new things come along, they become progressively more and more unprepared to actually deal with what they're facing. And as we go into the, if you like, more and more into the digital age, certainly employers ought to be able to rely upon having security literate employees who therefore don't pose a risk to the organisation as part of their day-to-day -day activities. So I say, one of the fundamental things I would suggest is that whilst the threats have increased, our ability to deal with them, our awareness of them, hasn't kept pace. So whilst many users might recognise some of the, if you like, the long-standing terminology of internet threats, so things like viruses, worms, wider malware, etc., their awareness, for example, of where that malware might come from, how they might get it onto their computer, onto their mobile devices, is perhaps not as keen as it should be. And even with some of the threats that we think that we recognise, our awareness of how to actually deal with them, how to secure our systems, is again perhaps lagging behind where it ought to be. Now, just to draw upon some fairly recent evidence from a um, survey done by BCS, the Chartered Institute for IT in the UK, they recently asked 326 digital leaders, as they termed it, what they thought the priorities in IT would be in the next three to five years. And as you can see there on the slide, the top issue that they identified was the issue of IT or information security and the ability to deal with that. Now, at the same time, those same digital leaders, only, uh, well, 57% actually thought that their existing workforce needed enhanced IT skills. So they felt that the staff that they've currently got aren't sufficiently prepared to deal with the technology that's in front of them. So this suggests a fair gap between where organisations think they need to be and where they think they currently are. Now, if we think about security, and I've just got a few little screen grabs here of the sort of interfaces that might just confront us in a standard everyday desktop operating system. So in this case, Windows 7 or Windows 8, I don't know which one I grabbed them from now. But this is just one set of, of security interfaces. So we've got the main security options that, that Windows 8 offers there. And then specifically some screen grabs of, I think, the smart screen phishing filter, user account control, Windows Firewall and Windows Defender to protect against malware. Now all of those things are there for the standard user. If you're thinking about somebody working at home on their own device, all of those things are there for them to configure. Now in some cases they can happily rely on the defaults and hope that that's doing the job. But really, in order to be a, a competent, <coughs> confident user of the technology, they ought to understand what those things actually mean. Okay? And this is sort of where I'm going with some of the, the content in this presentation. So what I'm thinking about here now in this next bit is, well, what are the basic things that we ought to think about as being security literacy for everyday users? So what I'm going to draw attention to here is what I've identified as eight core topics. Now, you might argue some are perhaps more important than others here, and there might be things that you think I've left off. But I would say that these eight things are fundamentally things that everyday users now ought to be aware of and thinking about and knowing what to do with on their technology. So they need to understand why these issues are important and also how they can actually address them for themselves on the technology they use. So the first one is something around user authentication. We face that requirement in pretty much everything we use, be it devices or online services. And I'll present some evidence as we go through that people don't necessarily deal with this very effectively in terms of, for example, selecting and managing passwords. Now, I won't read through everything that's on these slides. I'll flick through them fairly quickly just to highlight the issues. Another one that we need to be aware of, I would suggest, is backup. So we've got a lot of information that is important to us as individuals and important to organisations. When it comes down to our responsibility as individuals, 
Are we even aware of what we could lose if we were to have a system failure or a malware infection that was to actually destroy our original copies of data? That leads into the issue of protecting against malicious code. It can now come at us from all sorts of directions across multiple platforms and devices. Some are safer than others, it must be said. But nonetheless, it's something we need to make an informed decision about, have the protection and use it effectively. Mobile devices, increasingly we've got them. These are now a route by which we can cause harm to ourselves by using them in a, in a manner that isn't cognizant of the threat. And there's increasingly malicious code, for example, that can infect some of these platforms. In terms of how we use online services, so for example, social networks have been mentioned several <coughs> times today. There's numerous documented cases of people perhaps exposing too much about themselves in terms of personal information about their employer, their workspace, on social networks. So having some awareness of the information that we're sharing in that context and others online is something relevant. When we're using the internet and the web generally, there are lots of things that we could, we could find that are potentially problematic. So things like phishing threats, where somebody's trying to scam us into releasing sensitive information, but also the sorts of things that we could download. So there are, again, sites that are perhaps more reputable than others, and certain types of things that we could download that are harmful, and we will download them knowingly, not realizing that there's a problem attached. All of this relies on networking, and uh, as I said there are contexts in which people can find themselves connecting arbitrarily to networks that they don't know. So out in public, available Wi-Fi spot, how do you know that it's actually safe and it's not, for example, gathering the data that you're communicating over it? And also, actually setting up your own networking properly at home, so making sure that it's something that's protected from the outside world there. And finally, keeping our systems sufficiently up to date, making sure that when software updates are available, many of them are security related, they're labelled as critical updates, but many times people still neglect to install them until they're absolutely forced to do so. And so that leaves systems more exposed to malware and other types of online attack as a consequence. Okay, so it's all very well me saying this. Let's have a look at some evidence of some of the current practice. And what I'll draw upon here is some survey work that we did last autumn in the UK amongst a group of well, combined adult and under-18 response. Now, the under-18s were still all teenage users, so they were 14 and above would be my guess. There. So we weren't talking about primary school age children. These were active users of technology. And just to illustrate the point, just I'll flick through these relatively quickly. But what you'll see here is, in the case of the 18s and overs, a fair proportion of technology usage there. So a third of them had three or more devices, or th greater than three devices, rather, at home that were IT-related that they were regularly accessing. Sort of vaguely similar results for the under 18s as well. So in both age brackets, significant use of technology is the key message there. A variety of different platforms, again, I won't dwell too much on the specifics here, but you can see the, the fact that both age groups are significantly using different operating systems. We are specifically about mobile devices, and again, you can see significant representation there. Then we came to what were their security practices. And the first one that we asked about was, what do they do with software updates when they're notified that they're available? And what we can see is that, uh, well, it's not uniformly that they immediately install them and make sure that their system's protected. We have a, in the adult audience there, you know, some that generally ignore them. So that's almost 10% of people leaving their systems potentially exposed. And only a quarter claiming that they install immediately all the time. So those are the only ones who are definitely plugging the potential exposure that their system might have if it's a security-related update. Now, if we look at the younger audience, and what this then evidence is, is that good practice isn't being embedded at an earlier stage for this next generation that's now coming through. Look at the contrast now in terms of them, in terms of generally ignoring the updates. Okay, it's less convenient for them, it interrupts what they're trying to do, and so they're, they're not doing it. Similarly, when we come to password usage and use of user authentication, what we see on this slide is that both of the age groups have significant use of passwords, for example. They've got lots of systems that have password-related access. But then we look at their practices with passwords, and this is, or some of this stuff is, if you like, the good practice that you'd advocate. So you would suggest 
if you're following the textbook advice, to have at least eight characters in your password, to have a mix of alphabetic and numeric characters, to use special characters. All of this makes it harder for somebody to brute force crack the password with automated tools. To avoid using dictionary words and personal information and not to have the same thing on every system. But we can see lingering elements of bad practice there amongst both audiences. When it came to malware protection, we found that, okay, lots of people said that they had malware protection amongst the adult audience, slightly less when we jumped to the, uh, the under 18s. The thing was, whilst they had it, they weren't necessarily sure that their malware signatures were up to date. And this was the question that we asked here. Were they sure they were using up to date latest signatures on their system? So only 44% of the, the under 18s were sure that they were up to date protected. And if you don't have up to date signatures, you have a greater exposure to new threats that emerge every single day. So overall, we asked them about, or if we looked at the results, what was the overall level of good practice and bad practice? So here, how many responses did we have that installed updates immediately or if they were critical, we put them in the good category, had a password that met the baseline criteria and had up-to-date antivirus installed? And only 9% of the adult respondents met all of those criteria. So it's not particularly good. And looking at the adults in terms of bad practice, so if they claim to ignore updates or only install them at some point, which could of course be somewhat later, had a short password or one that was badly formed and didn't have antivirus or weren't sure if it was properly up to date, 11% met that. So actually more of them qualifying as explicitly bad practice than explicitly good. So there's still a security lesson here to be learnt. And briefly, we looked at mobile device security as well to see the extent to which they were using things there. And again, there were, for example, um, about 17, 18% of the respondents didn't have any authentication on their mobile device at all. So lots of sensitive information on the devices, but left unprotected against misuse. So what are we to be doing about this moving forward? How can we actually address this potential deficit of digital security literacy? One thing, we need public awareness, and there are things that are already done, so we've got potential advisory websites like Get Safe Online in the UK, Stay Safe Online in the US, and, and numerous other things of that nature. There are designated days or weeks or months when awareness raising campaigns are mounted. But these, from our results there, don't seem to be hitting home to quite the degree that it's embedding it amongst the people that need it. And perhaps there's been too much reliance on just the idea of build it and they will come in terms of we've got the advisory resources available, it just requires people to A, know that they're there and B, to use them. So perhaps a better route, and this is something that's uh, highlighted in a report uh, released in the UK just last week, is to start embedding things at an earlier stage. So this is something from the Department for Business Innovation and Skills in the UK. They've done a, basically a, an audit of cyber security skills and what ought to be done. And one of the key recommendations in this report, which can be downloaded online, is to get a greater penetration of the topic at an early stage in schooling not only for the benefit of, if you like, people who we want to go into the cyber security profession, but also the issue of wider awareness to make sure that people have the skills that they need to deal with the technology day to day. But it isn't just awareness raising, that's not going to, to satisfy all of it. So actually, despite all the awareness raising that's already been done, we see bad practices. Um, still quite prominently. And actually some of the greatest successes we've had in terms of uplifting security practice has come from other routes. So for example, raising the bar in terms of the default provision that systems come with or insist upon with security. So over the years, um, for example, firewall technologies have been built into desktop operating systems like Windows. When it first came along with a firewall in it, that firewall was not enabled by default. And so users didn't know it was there, didn't choose to switch it on. Systems effectively remained unprotected. First significant service pack, second service pack for Windows XP, so it was back in that era, the firewall became default enabled and suddenly a greater proportion of systems out there had protection by default. Similarly, with wireless access points and encryption on the access points, when they were sold with encryption as an option, most people didn't use it. And you had lots of stories of unprotected access points in homes and in organisations. When they then started to ship them with 
encryption enabled, people were much less inclined to make the effort to turn it off. They would live with it being on and they were more secure as a consequence. So there's many options where we could identify to uplift the baseline protection in that way. And this also applies to online services where they will still quite happily in many cases allow us to do things like choose extremely weak passwords to protect accounts where we could be lodging quite sensitive information including payment card details for example. But at the moment, we still have things where technology actively lets us use it badly. So, for example, you have antivirus on your system, but the system still allows users to defer the, the option to update their signatures. We still have the systems, in many cases, allowing users to defer updating for security updates. And, I say, having devices permitted to have lots of sensitive information on them, but no default authentication provision enabled. And so, I say lots of things that we could do in order to uplift this practice. At the same time, there's also an effort required on the, the part of the technology providers to make sure this technology is actually usable and tolerable for the user. So there are again many scenarios you can find where security is available, but you might well struggle to work out how to use it. So looking at the, the options available to you, so I've got on the screen there the security settings within Internet Explorer. It's been like this for the last decade or so, and a nice little slider that you can move up and down to set the security level from um, medium to medium high to high. But when you actually look at what it's describing at the different settings and what it means, so for example, um, the thing I was quite is the fact that at this setting, unsigned ActiveX controls will not be downloaded. Well, what does that actually mean to the user? And how does that then differentiate their protection if they move the slider up and down? If you can't understand what the protection actually means, it's all very well having a nice little slider, but you still can't understand it. So more can be done to design for the users and what they're likely to understand and make it explanatory as far as possible. So, in conclusion then, security literacy, I would argue, needs to be a key underpinning aspect within the wider context of digital skills. And I think we're still some way short of achieving this, and we've had many years to, to actually up our game there. So there's still an effort required to support the current users, who in many cases are struggling through, and certainly an opportunity to ensure that the next generation are better prepared as they move through, which unfortunately our, our results at the moment suggest that's just not happening. And, well, I say, as we continue to promote digital literacy in a wider context, the use of information technologies for all manner of applications that people want to use, it is essential that awareness of security and being able to use it safely comes alongside that. And with that, I will conclude and hand over to the next person. Thank you very much.